In this video, I aim to help you crack essay writing on prose text for pre-U English. The first part contains some general tips on the pre-U English essay writing process, before in the second part, I go on to explore the assessment objectives. I reference paragraphs from an essay I have written on Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders to help illustrate each assessment objective and make it easier for you to understand what the examiner is looking for. However, you do not need to have read The Woodlanders in order to find this video useful. Although the assessment objectives refer explicitly to Cambridge International Examinations Pre-U English course, the, the assessment objectives are similar in, to those in equivalent qualifications such as the AQA A-Level English Literature course. So stay tuned and prepare to sharpen your understanding of A-Level Pre-U English Literature essay writing. This is Schofield on Shakespeare. When thinking about the essay writing process, some people overlook the obvious. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to write a decent literature essay if you have not previously thoroughly read and spent time thinking about your text. For exam texts, it is vital to have read it at least twice and ideally made notes when reading it for the second or the third time. You can see on screen now my cheap copy of Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders. Within the first page, I have set up a colour-coded system for thinking about the text, which will help me organise my thoughts. Any points on the themes of the book, I will use the blue from my four-colour big pen. Points about characters in red. Points about the context in black and interesting language features or anything else in green. To be honest, I don't think it particularly matters what the system is or what you choose to highlight. What matters is that when reading for the second or third time, you are firmly engaging with the text and beginning the process of independently thinking about it. I also don't think it matters whether you prefer to annotate, as I've done here, or handwrite notes or type out bullet point notes on your tablet or computer. With Woodlanders, I ended up buying two copies, both of them relatively cheap and second hands, one for annotations and another clean, smarter copy, so that I continue to keep thinking about the text and don't just simply see a few annotations and implicitly think that that is all there is to say about a particular page or section. Here's a scanned in double page from chapter 16 of The Woodlanders. On the left, I have a note in red about a character called Giles. I have scrawled that he has far more simple, honest feelings about love in comparison to that debauched doctor, Edward Fitzpiers. Also on that page, I've used blue to make a point about the theme of class. This doctor of a higher class is dismissive of the place in which they live and seems to view women as having the principal aim of providing pleasure for men. On the right hand side I have made a note about the theme of fate, observing that this seems to be drawing Giles and a woman called Grace apart, while simultaneously bringing Grace closer to that Dr Fitzpiers. Above this I have looked up the footnote from the back of the book, which reveals that the question who hath gathered the wind in his fists, who hath bound the waters in a garment, is quoting the book of Proverbs from the Bible, chapter 30, verse 4. Once you know a text really well and have read it a few times, you can move to the next stage, planning for a particular essay. There are all sorts of different ways in which you can plan. Some people like using mind maps, others bullet point notes, Again, I don't think the system particularly matters, only that you allow sufficient time to make this clear, organised plan. In my experience, a number of pupils can struggle to precisely answer the question, and so I always think it worthwhile to copy out the title in large letters and pin it up by your desk a few days before an essay is due to be handed in, so that you have plenty of thinking time. 
It's so important to avoid the temptation of writing everything you know about a text rather than actually answering the question. For my own essay on the straightforward title, Explore the Character of Mr. Melbury in Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders, I set up a simple grid, the first part of which will appear on screen now. You can see that I have two columns. On the left hand side is my point column, which contains a clear point which answers the question and can potentially be used at the very beginning of a paragraph. Note my adverb potentially. You do not have to exactly stick to your plan. As you continue to think, you may slightly modify your ideas or come up with better ways of expressing them. But crucially, having a written plan will inevitably make your essay clearer and more focused, irrespective of whether you stick exactly to it or deviate from time to time. As you can see, I like using colours within the plan. On the right hand side, I have specified in red the quotations that I plan to use. Both the presence and the choice of quotations is vital. They can help ensure your insight into the text is detailed rather than overly general. And the right quotations can give you opportunities to explore the effects of language, form and structure. Perhaps at this stage my quotations are too long and so I will probably need to cut them down in the actual essay. I still have plenty of writing to do within the essay itself. I would need to explore the writer's language and develop my initial point from the beginning of the paragraph. However, with this system, I know that with the very first sentence, I will be focusing on the question and avoiding any temptation to narrate rather than analyse. You can also see in blue a quotation about the context. At this level, you need to show an awareness of a text's context, and this awareness needs to be integrated within your argument. To return to my specific essay on Mr. Melbury in The Woodlanders, I don't want to be too critical of him because although he is certainly patronising his daughter and not allowing her to make her own decisions, to a significant extent this would have been standard practice for fathers in the late 19th century. How should your essays be structured beyond the presence of an introduction at the beginning and a conclusion at the end? Well. It's important not to be too prescriptive with this, as I think the pre-U examiners like to reward particularly creative, imaginative, insightful approaches to literature. Nonetheless, it's useful to keep at the back of your mind a paragraph structure similar to the one about to appear on screen, even if you do deviate it from it from time to time. First up, show the examiner that you are not a waffler and that you are going to present an argument sharply focused on the question. And this argument is going to show a detailed understanding of the text, partly through carefully chosen quotations. However, don't just plonk them down. You will often need one or two sentences to explain what is happening in the text at this point, as this will of course inform how we re-respond to the language within the quotations. Don't miss out this section. Some of my pupils have been so focused on developing their arguments that they have neglected opportunities to explore the effect of interesting word and structure choices by the writer. Remember, the use of a quotation in itself is simply copying. It is what you say about a quotation which is going to get you the marks. Perhaps you won't always be able to do this. But towards the end of each paragraph, you should be thinking more deeply about your argument. And having referenced one part of the text, you may now have additional ideas about the topic you are exploring. Incorporating points about the social historical context can give further insight into your argument, as can probing critical viewpoints. It's not always easy to find appropriate critical sources particularly for slightly lesser known texts, even if by well-known authors. In the case of this video, for instance, it is much easier to find critical viewpoints on Thomas Hardy's Tess of the Durbervilles or the Mayor of Casterbridge rather than the Woodlanders. For example, pupils studying Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre 
can purchase a York Notes A-Level Guide, which includes a full section on context and critical debates. This consists of succinct summaries of different critical approaches, which you can reference and explore within your own arguments. There is also generally an introductory essay at the front of your copy of the text, which is worth reading after you have read the book. I rather enjoyed Philip Mallet's essay about the Woodlanders in the Wordsworth Classics edition, which included plenty of interesting references to critical sources, including an intriguing suggestion that a death scene is marked by a perverse eroticism, whereby sickness and love death substitute for consummation. This wasn't relevant to the essay I was writing on Mr. Melbury, but would be perfect to explore within, say, an essay exploring key relationships in the novel, or the presentation of love. Many schools subscribe to online databases such as English Review, EMAG, JSTOR and Drama Online. You can see on screen now the results for a search on Woodlanders from the English Review Archive. These articles are aimed at A-level students, and so the language is comprehensible and not unnecessarily complicated. But only four resources appear for the Woodlanders, with most of them presumably briefly referencing the novel whilst exploring in the main another one. However, if you change the search from Woodlanders to Tess, the number of resources increased from 4 to 287, with some clearly interesting articles coming up. Hardy's Tess, A Pure Woman, Putting Faith in Tess, Religion in Tess of the D'Urbervilles. The English and Media Centre's e-magazine is also good, although once again largely for the better known exam texts. Searching on the Woodlanders brings up two resources, but with Jane Eyre, there are 75 available. JSTOR has a much greater number of resources, access to 12 million academic journal articles and primary sources, but the language can be much harder to understand, as this website is aimed at the university academic community. So finding appropriate critical sources on demand can be difficult and time consuming. My recommendation would be to incorporate regular critical reading as part of your routine, something you do automatically once you have finished reading a text and prior to necessarily an essay title being set. Get interested in the viewpoints of others for those texts you are studying, making notes as you read. If you can do this, you may already have some material to refer to when it comes to writing specific essays or preparing for your exams. In terms of the context, I am a fan of the Oxford World's Classics Authors in Context series. Both the Bronte and the Hardy editions are excellent. If your novel is used regularly at A-level, as previously mentioned, you can reference the A-level guides. It's now time for the second part of this video, looking at the assessment objectives. You need to have these in the back of your mind when writing your essays, as, sadly, however brilliantly written your essay is, if you don't cover certain areas, you ain't going to get that top mark. Assessment Objective 1. Essentially, how well your essay is written, how interesting and thought-provoking your argument is, and how well you weave in intelligently selected quotations. Assessment Objective 2. How well do you explore the writer's use of form, structure and language? Assessment Objective 3. Do you have an awareness of what the writer is trying to do or achieve in the novel as a whole? Can you weave in and respond to the occasional critical viewpoint? Assessment Objective 4. Do you integrate ideas and points about the different contexts of the text and not just the social and historical? To give you an example, if writing about Hardy's The Mayor of Casterbridge, 
Do you accept the argument that Shakespeare's King Lear forms part of the literary context of this novel? And if so, do you successfully integrate this into your arguments? AO1 requires an exceptionally insightful, personal, original point of view. Read through the paragraph on screen now, taken from my essay exploring the presentation of Mr Melbury in Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders. How does it meet this particular objective? So read it through carefully now and press pause. I think these essays need to be interesting as well as well written. In my essay on Mr Melbury in The Woodlanders, I make all kinds of important points about his love for his daughter, the fact that his meddling causes her untold harm, the fact that he is held back by blind belief in social customs. However, in this paragraph, I wanted to come at the question from a different angle to suggest that the entire community seemed to be infected by this melancholy lack of fulfilment within love, meaning that perhaps we should not judge him too harshly. AO1 also requires an argument seamlessly interwoven with textual supports, eloquent expression. Read through this paragraph. How does it meet this particular objective? Press pause now. Note how I introduce the context of the quotation. I don't just plonk it down. Note also my use of the adverb anxiously when explaining the context. This single word helps illustrate my understanding of his character at this point, whilst also allowing me to seamlessly introduce the quotation. I also requote a small phrase to enable me to give, give some more precise insight into the writer's language, which leads me on nicely to AO2 requires perceptive and subtle exploration of the roles of form, structure and language. Read through the rest of this paragraph from the same essay. How does it meet this particular objective? Press pause now. Here I have drawn attention to the writer's use of syntax and more pertinently the effect of this. Note also how I have explored connotations of the verb give and how this emphasises Melbury's unwittingly repressive patriarchal attitude towards his daughter. AO3 requires you to relate part to whole where relevant in a seamless manner. How do I do this here? Press pause now. Whilst of course you must quote individual details, these should act as a springboard to give broader insight into the essay title and novel as a whole. Here, I spring athletically from quoting Melbury's delighted response to Fitzpiers' revelation about his unwittingly honourable attentions to Grace, to suggest that he is hampered by his reverence for the upper classes not just here, but in the novel, and that there are significant consequences for this. AO3 also requires the use of relevant critical debate where appropriate. Read through this paragraph. How do I ensure that my critical reference isn't just a hopeful tag on, but relevant to my arguments? Press pause now. Note here that I have probed the critical viewpoint, which is more interesting and intelligent than blindly agreeing or disagree. AO4 asks for well-informed discussion of the significance of literary, social, cultural contexts. Read the paragraph on screen now, also taken from the same essay exploring the presentation of Mr Melbury in Thomas Hardy's The Woodlanders. Do you agree this paragraph meets this assessment objective, and if so, how? Press pause now. The key principle is that I haven't just got a section talking generally about the social historical context, perhaps within the introduction, although this does have some value, I've integrated it within my core argument. 
It is precisely because women had so few opportunities in the mid to late 19th century that Mr. Melbury is right to worry about his daughter's future. It is understandable because of this context that he is so desperate to intervene. It looks like we've got to the end of this video, which has given tips on the pre-U, A-level essay writing process and practical examples of how to meet the different assessment objectives. I hope it's been useful. Many thanks for watching.